Speaking totally aside, speaking of Rich, I, um, I know some of you don't know him, but uh, uh, he's, just, he's just the reason, he's one of the reasons psychotherapy is where it is today. He was sort of the wizard behind the curtain. He took all these great people that you, that every 27-year-old new therapist out of grad school knows, and he taught them how to speak, how to write, how to share their ideas in ways people could really understand. And he did that through the magazine and this conference. I remember the first time Rich uh, allowed me to introduce a speaker. <laughs> and uh, he taught me everything I know about introducing people and writing. And uh, I, I gave him my first draft. And I got, so. <laughs> what do you think the point of an introduction is? <laughs> and I told him. And he said, do that. <laughs> and I never knew anybody that he so, so the, the, he, I think he just had one trick. <laughs> All right. All right, let's, let's move on. <clears throat> the moment, uh, 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 maybe the moment you've all been waiting for. No, not dessert, you already have dessert. You know, every now and again, someone, someone comes along like Rich in our field who completely changes the conversation that everyone else is having. And tonight's award recipient is one of those people. As his, uh, as his work took shape in the early 1980s, he was beset by a field of psychotherapy dominated by behaviorism and psychoanalysis. But where the analysts saw mental distress as the result of a single self that's been fragmented, he saw these parts that people seem to have as natural, as healthy, parts of a system. And fueled by the work of family systems therapists before him, he would go on over the next 30 years to blaze a trail that would set the world of psychotherapy on fire. And today, there is no approach, there is no approach that has caused such intense interest among the general public more than internal family systems therapy. But, and it's a big but, what a lot of people don't know is just how unlikely any of this was to happen. So get ready. The developer of IFS was a shy, anxious child with ADHD in the suburbs of Chicago. He was the oldest of six boys from a very scientific, rigorous family. His father was the chief of medicine. Picture this, the chief of medicine at a large Chicago hospital, and he was supposed to follow in those footsteps. Three of his brothers did, but in part due to his learning difficulties, which frustrated him through his whole life. He struggled feeling different. And instead of medical school, he spent his early 20s wandering and hitchhiking around the country. He worked on railroads, at power plants. He served at restaurants. I think it was dessert, a dessert server, was it? <laughs> Which he wasn't very good at because he kept forgetting the orders. <laughs> Just think about it. Your family is going to medical school and you can't remember dessert orders. His dad eventually got him an entry-level job at the hospital as a kind of therapeutic aid, we might call them today, who kind of just hung out with troubled teens, you know? Go do something with them. And as it would happen, though, it was that time with those troubled teens that inspired him to become a family therapist. But he quickly became disillusioned even with family therapy. It was a time when very famous family therapists promised almost 
miraculous results. They almost had these larger-than-life personalities. So, being the very scientifically-minded person that he is, he began doing research to see if he could get the same outcomes that they promised. He did first did research with bulimic patients, which showed in his results with his, uh, with his clinic and his, his other therapists at his clinic, very little effect. And this bothered him deeply. So he did what all of us should do when our therapy is not working. He asked his patients, why don't you think this is working? And whether it was his teens that he worked with or the bulimic patients, they all began to tell him about these sort of parts inside that thought he was full of shit. <laughs> and that would criticize them, like these, these inner critics. You know, that idea of an inner critic was just not a part of the vernacular of therapy at the time. And some of these inner parts attacked them quite viciously. And so he went further, and he began actually listening to these parts as if they were sort of their own persons, just to kind of see what would happen, honestly. And word quickly spread. And you got to understand, this wasn't a time when you could go on Instagram and talk about your new ideas, okay? You did something different than the conventional uh, established orthodoxy of therapy. You got a lot of attention from that leadership. So it wasn't long before the white coats at the hospital, the psycho psychoanalysts uh, and psychiatrists, invited him in to talk about these new things he was doing. <laughs> Why don't you come tell us? <laughs> We'd like to hear more. And for the first time, he found himself in a room full of psychiatrists with these white coats, and it was not a warm reception. One rather renowned psychiatrist, whose name I will not mention in that meeting, called him a dangerous menace, that he was fragmenting people, hurting people, and promptly, with his position, tried to get him fired from the hospital and end his career. But as he continued on, he didn't stop. He went to family therapy conferences to see how they might respond. It didn't get any better. He was quite literally run out of some of the biggest and smaller family therapy conferences around the country. People would literally stand up in the audience during and after his presentation decrying how he was hurting people. And I asked him, how did you get through those days? And he said, and I quote, I just had a part of me that didn't give a shit. <laughs> More than that, though, he was driven actually by something else. And that was a deep belief that patient experience should be our greatest teachers. And I think if we have anything to learn from this man, it's that we need to listen to our patients. We need to follow their experience. And it, it was actually that father, that same chief of medicine in Chicago, who instilled in him this idea to always listen to patients. His father said to him once, and I quote, if Dick, if it's showing up in people, it's data. Always follow the data and follow the data he did. And IFS spread like wildfire. Despite being run out of conferences, IFS grew. People were interested. And then came along a rather eccentric guy who kind of wanted to hear more. And that was the founder of this conference, Rich Simon, who passed away in 2020. Many of his very first articles and stories were published in the Psychotherapy Networker magazine. Subscriptions are just $12 a year. <laughs> Did I? <clears throat> was, was it, that was another part of me. <laughs> it 
Rich Simon was one of the first people on the national level to give voice to what would be soon become internal family systems. And if you knew Rich, you know he didn't give a shit either. He never cared much for claims of authority. He wasn't interested in being a gatekeeper for the people who were already in power. He wanted to share interesting ideas and let therapists decide, and that's what this damn conference is all about. And therapists did decide. Today, IFS is one of the most popularized therapy approaches on the planet. Last I checked, 20,000 therapists are on the waiting list to train in IFS, something like that. 20,000 are waiting to train. He holds an appointment at Harvard University. Major studies are underway in this approach. The amazing thing though, I've rarely met anyone less interested in promoting himself, <laughs> truly. In fact, he told me when IFS started getting attention, he said, boy, I hope someone comes along who can actually do something with this. <laughs> and whether or not you practice IFS, to watch him work, to see how he sits with clients is a master class in presence. He's truly one of the masters of our time. As a personal example of his ability to honor experiences and see the best in people, his incredible wife, Jean, a great therapist in her own right, gave me permission to share this. I didn't ask Dick for permission for reasons that may become obvious. She, she said, she said when they met, he very, very simply asked in his own signature calm way, so would you be interested in dating me? <laughs> and Jean answered, well, sure, you, you know, if I didn't live so far away and if I didn't have to take the train to see you and you weren't older than me, and maybe if I wasn't already seeing someone, then, yeah, maybe. <laughs> to which Dick replied, oh, great. <laughs> Jean, what, what do you mean? I, I just gave you all the reasons this is never gonna work. To which Dick said, well, I always like to look on the bright side. <laughs> Seemed to work out pretty well. I could say, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I could say a lot more about him, but perhaps it's best said by those who know him best. Let's see it. Yeah, you know, when I think about Dick, I actually go to two places, not two parts, but two places, um, both personal and professional. And I think the word that comes to mind right away is gratitude. We met at the Psychotherapy Networker Conference. He was sort of in the earliest stages of having all this enthusiasm and passion about this little thing called IFS, Internal Family Systems. And he was so generous and he sat with me and he listened with so much presence and so much care like he always does and always has. And I just felt so supported by him. When I think about Dick Schwartz, I think first of all, of just a very warm presence and uh, of someone who's very committed to his craft and also to healing the world in a very unique way. To my mind, IFS, Internal Family Systems Therapy, is probably the major advance in the psychotherapy of post-traumatic stress and developmental trauma. Carl Jung talked about it, Shakespeare talked about it, uh, William James talked about it, is that we have multiple selves. And that's such an important issue and what Dick really clarified for us is that we develop parts of ourselves to protect us against overwhelming hurt and pain. If these parts continue to be unintegrated, they may actually cause you quite a bit of harm. But 
identity won't go away, according to IFS, until you really honor and understand what role they have played in your own survival. As a physician, very aware of, very conscious of the mind-body unity in health and illness, I've met no other model that's as close to why I understand things based on my experience as a physician. So it's that unity and enable the capacity to use a model to explore how our development in order to survive certain environments creates dynamics that later on create problems for us. Um, that, that, that's, I think, is his great contribution. What I've seen over the years, fortunately, is this global understanding and acceptance that paradoxically, when you really allow for the acknowledgement of each part of who we are, that that really ultimately leads to integration. And I think what Dick brought to the field through IFS was this really very different approach, which is you can't get rid of any part and that that's not the goal, that's not the intention. It's about embracing, acknowledging, validating, listening to every single part, but yet never getting rid of any part. And he was right, because ultimately that's what created, I think, a sense of wholeness, particularly for traumatized clients who came into the work dissociative and fragmented. I'm delighted that Dick is getting this Lifetime Achievement Award and I also hope not only that he gets this award, but that the clinicians who practice this work, who work with these people, all learn about internal family systems therapy. So it's one of the greatest, and I really mean this, it's one of the greatest honors of my life. And I wish Rich were here right now. And I think he is. To present the Psychotherapy Networker Lifetime Achievement Award. Psychotherapy Networker and the entire field of therapy owes a debt of gratitude. So it's my great honor to present the 2023 Psychotherapy Networker Lifetime Achievement Award to Richard Schwartz. I uh, have to say I'm, I'm really choked up, so give me a second, and I hope I brought my notes. Oh, here they are, okay. Because I am still that shy, ADD little boy who needs to read. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it feels really, really good. Um, Part of why I'm so honored by this is because the networker is the premier organization in the field of psychotherapy, and more than any other group has changed the face of psychotherapy. Uh, when I was coming up, as Zach alluded to, it was all behavioral therapy or CBT or psychoanalysis. <clears throat> and Things like EMDR, somatic experiencing, IFS, uh, family therapy itself would be very small little parochial worlds if not for the networker. So I'm, I wanna attribute, uh, I wanna honor you guys as well. It's been amazing, I'm so glad that uh, you've been able to keep it going and keep the spirit, like I said, what was this morning? <laughs> 
um, as well as my friend Bessel and Dan Siegel and you know, all of us owe a huge debt of gratitude to the networker. And I want to say, because this is a tribute to Rich tonight, and I want to echo what many of you said, but also to say that I think more than anyone else except me, Rich is responsible for the existence of IFS, or at least the size of it. When I met him at the networker, it was a newsletter called The Family Stick. And we were mainly basketball buddies who hung out at family therapy conferences to fawn over our heroes, Mnuchin and Satir and Haley. And in 1983, when I started learning from my clients about parts, as you mentioned, my family therapy colleagues saw me as a traitor. The psychoanalysts in my department tried to get me fired. But Rich was intrigued and Rich uh, became the person I looked to to try and help me bring this to the world. <clears throat> and particularly after my experience with this, the analysts, I was shy about putting IFS out there, and as, I, as you said, I was a shy ADD little guy. <clears throat> and Rich pushed me to work with that part and published my first article our multiple selves, and after thoroughly simonizing it, which the so was a, a, a common refrain, uh, and then he talked me into doing the first national presentation at AFTA in 1985, and my family therapy colleagues were predictably skeptical about the whole thing, and, uh, but he was an amazing schmoozer and connector and kind of ran interference for me. And after about 10 more articles on IFS for the networker, each of which he should have been co-author on. Uh, so yeah, Rich is here, I, I feel him, I feel his presence, and uh, I'm just so grateful to you guys for carrying on his legacy. And so not just for this award, but also keeping Rich's spirit alive after his death. You guys have such an important role to, to play in this field and continue to play, and his shoes are big shoes to fill. And I mean that literally, because he had big feet and <laughs> big hands compared to the rest of his body, which is why he was such a good basketball player. <laughs> so I'll continue to support you as long as I live. I think this is something like my 35th straight year, except for last year, presenting here. And now I want to thank some others who helped to get me here. First to Mnuchin and Satir, who are, whose family therapy frameworks I just kind of overlaid on this internal system. And second, uh, a guy named Ron Kurtz, who is under known, I think, but developed something called Hakomi. And I collaborated with them for a number of years in the early days and borrowed a bunch of stuff. We cross-pollinated all, all over the place. And um, I've been lucky to have the steady support of my family over all these years. Uh, my wife, Jean, who's here, who... Uh, <laughs> tattled on me about our first day. <laughs> Uh, but I, I really am so grateful for being, you being such a wonderful partner on this journey and, uh, and for embracing IFS and uh, being just such a wonderful emotional and intellectual companion. It, it's been enormous for me. So I'm just so grateful to you, sweetie. I'm also grateful to my beautiful three daughters, two of whom are here, right here. The third one used the excuse of having had a baby a week and a half ago. So. <laughs> and then also to my first wife, Nancy, who supported me and the model in its formative years. Well, at times I wasn't 
present as much as all of us would have wished. And then also to the community of IFS trainers, therapists, coaches who've made it their own and have taken it places I never could. I also want to thank Duran, our uh, first award winner, because uh, she brought into our community so many BIPOC therapists, and our community is unbelievably enriched by, by Duran, really. So I, I totally <laughs> honor you for that. Finally, I want to thank my clients who welcome me into their inner sanctums, sacred inner worlds, and taught me that their parts weren't what they seemed and that they, they had this essence that was pure healing energy. And then, Rich, you and I dreamed about IFS reaching this level of influence, so I wish I could have been getting this award from you and I'm really glad you're here, and I'm really grateful you're still one of my guides. So, thank you everyone, and uh, yeah, just, just very, very moved. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. You're gonna... You're going to make me cry, so cut it out. <laughs>